All right, so we have data here that shows the results of an attempt to answer in a question, a question about whether or not echinacea, this natural remedy, has any impact on the likelihood of one getting a cold, right? So if you get exposed to a virus, are you less likely to get a cold if you are taking this natural supplement? So in this example, we have an independent variable, and that independent variable would be um, the drug itself, and the dependent variable, which depends on the efficacy of this, is whether or not you get infected. So the independent is kind of the input or the treatment, and the dependent depends in some sense on, or at least we're investigating whether or not it depends on the, indi um, on the independent variable. So are these two related is, is what we're trying to answer, right? The question of whether or not um, the treatment has any impact or correlation with the outcome. Um, that being, you know, whether or not someone's infected. So we have these numbers that we can look at. Um, and we want to do some analysis to make sense of these numbers. So of those that were infected, there were some number of individuals that uh, that had taken the placebo um, and some that had taken this extract A and then some that, that had taken extract B. And um, the 20% extract, um, let's, let's just, to not confuse or have to worry about the difference between the two extracts, and to not, not let those numbers cause any confusion, I'm, you know, maybe consider this treatment A, which is the placebo. Um, this one here, we're going to say treatment B, and this one is treatment C. Do those treatments um, have any impact? Is there a correlation between the treatment versus the infection status? So, now, in order for our analysis to to work we're going to compare um, these observed values right so this is a sample and these are are observed and we have these guys over here independent right um, the placebo is not a function of whether or not someone gets in, infected but whether or not you get infected you know, could certainly be dependent upon whether or not you get the treatment or the independent variable. So that's the connection. These are dependent on, we're assuming that these are dependent upon those um, those independent variables. So what, if they're independent, right, if there's no connection, what, um, what values can be expected. And so the way we're going to approach this is that we're going to look at the totals and just kind of pull these values off the table for consideration. Um, so let me go ahead and, and write those totals in and, and then let's talk about that. Um, the totals, let's see these values of, indefect, of, of infected individuals, uh, what are we looking at, 188, and then this one is 29, and so we're looking at a total here of 207. Um, the totals in this column would be 52, 52, um, and then this one would be 103, and of course, those also would add up to fifty uh, to two hundred seven. If I didn't make any mistakes here, so this is going to be nineteen and ten, twenty nine. So that's correct. Now let's take another look at this. What if? we work backwards. 
and we have the totals here. So we have the, the treatments here, the placebo, the 20% extract, the 60% extract. So the question then is, um, knowing the totals, knowing that we had 207 individuals, um, what is maybe the probability of getting infected and uh, receiving the placebo in, uh, a treatment. So the probability of getting infected um, and also um, probability of getting infected and receiving one of the treatments. So we're going to look at you know this first one here um, and receiving the placebo. So what is that one number? Well, if they are independent, right, if there's no conditional probability here and they're independent, um, then we're not going to work with conditional probability, but we will work with um, the assumption that they're independent. So the probability of being infected, I'll just say the probability of I, and it's going to be the product of those two um, variables, random variables, and the probability of receiving the, pl the placebo. So what's the probability of receiving um, well, what's the probability of one being infected? Well, out of the total, there were 178 individuals out of 207 that were infected. And the probability of one receiving a placebo, right? So we have the 178. And then the probability of one receiving the placebo is 103 over 207. So um, the probability of one being infected and the probability of receiving the placebo is the product of those two values there. So that value, if you crunch those numbers, you should get 0 0.42787. Zero point four two seven eight seven four two seven eight seven. So the probability of those two events occurring if they are independent. And so we have something that we expect if they're independent. There's a probability associated with that. Notice that I took the one seventy eight divided by 207 and a 103 divided by 207. Um, now let's look at this next cell here. The probability of being infected and assuming independence, the probability um, of receiving treatment B or the 20% extract. So um, I'll just say the 20% extract. So the probability, if they're independent, the probability of being infected and receiving the 20% extract would be the product of those two numbers. So what's the probability of being infected? Again, um, it's 178 over 207 and the probability of the 20% extract is going to be 52 over 207. And so that probability, let's figure out what that is, is 0.216014.
0 0.216014. So 0 0.216014. So, and we could continue on and get, um, assuming independence, get the probabilities associated with these two events, um, infection and treatment, not infected in a particular treatment. We could do that for each one of those. So this is what you would expect if the variables aren't, if one doesn't depend on the other, um, if they're independent. Right? If there's no contingency between the two. Now, given that these are the expected um, percentages and proportions under the assumptions of, of independence, we can use this, right? We can use that value, the expected, for, let's call this row one, column one. And it's one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, and then this one is going to be row one, column two, row one, column three, row two, column one, row two, column two, row two, column three. So the, um, if we look at this one value right here, in order for us to take this proportion and turn it into a number that's expected out of 207, 207, then I'm going to have to take my 207 and multiply that by the 0.42787. So the expected value for row one, column one, is going to be this number here. So 0.42787 times um, 207 is 88.57, if I take it to two decimal places, 0 0.569. So 88.57. And if I do this again for the next value is going to be a proportion of that 207 times the expected, um, t uh, the proportion or the total count times the, uh, the expected proportion, which is the 207 times the point 216014. And let's do that, 0 0.216014 times 207. That's 44.715. So what I'm putting down here are expected values out of the 207, 44.715. And if you notice, now let's generalize, that this number, the 0.4, Let's do the first one. That one right there took the 178. So that is this marginal, this margin value, and the 103. So it looks like if I take, to get the expected value, I'm going to take the total number times um, what were those values? The 178 times the 207. So let's do it like this. 
it was the 178 and I'll just use the numbers here 178 uh, let's get this so it's 207 times that fraction there that percentage and that is 178 over 207 times 103 over 207 and so that setup that we see here is going to be consistent um, where we have the grand total times the row value and the column value so let's simplify this right and what you get basically here you're left with the row total that's the 178 times the column total which is the 103 all over the grand total so that is going to allow us to get to, to perform and execute a, a, um, a quicker calculation for the expected values for any one spot it's just going to be the um, the row total 178 times the column total in this case it would be 52 here um, divided by the grand total which would be the 207 for this one here the row total 29 column total 103 um, grand total 207 so I'll stop there I think you can see the pattern um, the 178 the 178 times the 52 divided by the 207 gives us 44.175 44.75 And the next one gives us 29 times 103. 29 times 103 divided by 207. And we get 14.43. So we can complete this, but we can also use our calculator to help us generate these values. So um, if we go in and let's create that first table of observed values. Let's see if we already have it in here. So let's turn this on. Let's go to second and then matrix. And let's just hit, let's see where we, we're on. So number one, matrix A. Let's see what's there. Matrix A has the 88, the 48, the 15, and so forth. So those should be the same values that we have here. Um, and that's correct. So we do indeed have the observed values in our matrix there. When doing this test, um, this setup that we're doing now is this contingency test chi-squared um, contingency test or hypothesis test. I'm going to go here, select chi-squared test, and let's say I want to put the results of what's expected into matrix C. So let's select, well, let's, look, let's make sure it's an empty matrix. So let's say matrix, and then let's drop down to D. I know that that one has not been populated yet. So the results should be shown in um, matrix D. So I'll hit calculate. So I get my chi-squared statistic. I get my probability, uh, my p-value. 
and degrees of freedom. Now, if you go back and look at what was previously an empty matrix, you see that now it's populated and those values, 88.57, 44.7, 44.7, and 14, etc., et those are the expected values. And that is what we need to calculate our, our, uh, our test statistic. Our test statistic that we're going to co uh, compare to a critical value. Um, is just simply going to be the summation of all of the observed minus the expected values all over the expected values and we're going to square that and what that would look like would be um, if you're doing this by hand right we've already generated it on the calculator and we've shown it there but if you do it by hand the test statistic would be the 88 minus the 88.57 squared over the expected 88.57 plus the 48 minus the what's expected the theoretical expected under the assumption of independence 48 minus uh, 44.7 15 squared over 44.715 and so you're going to do this for all six values if you're doing this by hand. And when doing this by hand, you should get the same value that we just saw on our calculator. What was that number? Chi-squared test. Um, let's go ahead and show what that is. So you doing it if if you do it by hand, you should expect to see that this value is 2.93. And if you want to figure out what the p-value is, you can also use that um, that 2.93 to determine what the p-value is. So if you go to distributions chi-squared, I think that's number eight, and then you use your 2.93. degrees of freedom and we get 0.23 if we do it ourselves versus letting the calculator um, do that for us. And don't forget that the degrees of freedom for this test is going to be um, row minus number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one number of rows we saw to be two subtract one from that number of columns we saw it to be three. Subtract one for that, and that's where we're getting our two for our degrees of freedom. So that's how we determine expected, well, that's how we calculate expected values, and that's uh, the, a bit of the thinking behind, behind, uh, behind those calculations. Um, and your calculator would, would do quite a bit of this for you. So once you have your, there are a couple of, we need to make a decision, right? Once you have your value for your P, your test statistic, then you have a couple of ways of moving, moving forward with that. You can compare it to a critical value for a given confidence level. It's, uh, I think we used alpha equals 0 0.05. And, one, and then what you can do is take your um, test statistic, our 2.93, and look to see if you're in the rejection region or not. So that critical value um, is, let's see what that is. So at so our critical value is going to come from our, our, our table, um, and we're going to go into our table using degrees of freedom and then the alpha level. The degrees of freedom 
or the alpha level in this case was 0 0.05, but the degrees of freedom was two. Let's see if we can pull up the table quickly. So if we go into our chi-squared table using 2 for our degrees of freedom and using 0 0.05, which would be the area to the right of the critical value, that's the confidence level, we end up with a critical value of 5.991. And so that's why we're showing the 5.991. Our test statistic was not in the critical region. We ended up over here um, for our value of 2.93. And um, so whether we use our test statistic um, to make a decision, that critical value, right, the 2.93, or whether we use the p-value and compare it to alpha, um, since our p-value was greater than alpha or equivalently since our test statistic was not in the rejection region um, we failed to reject the null hypothesis and don't forget that when we were calculating the expected values um, the null hypothesis is that, is that we said the infection is independent of treatment if they are independent um, of treatment, what will those differences look like? Well, if the difference between observed and expected is large, your test statistic gets larger and larger and larger and larger. If your test statistic is large, you're going to fall into the rejection region. So if you're falling into the rejection region, it means that your differences were large enough for us to get there. Um, and so there's a real, you know, that there's, it doesn't seem to be a, a, uh, any correlation between observed and what's expected. The infection is independent of treatment. And our hypothesis, um, right, if it's so far that we end up rejection, rejecting this, then it means that um, getting an infection and the treatment are actually dependent. So in this case, the observed and the expected are close enough that we don't reject the null hypothesis it, or we have evidence to support that getting an infection is independent of treatment um, and echinacea therefore um, doesn't really seem to have any um, significant impact um, on, on reducing one's infection at least not at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level.